Hello, we are the Newharth family. I was raised in a good Christian home. I grew up singing bass and playing the piano. I was also raised in a good Christian home, but I rebelled against the hypocrisy I saw. By the grace of God, I have since discovered that living life with Christ is ridiculously better than I could have ever imagined. Now let us have a little talk with Jesus. Let us tell him all about our troubles. He will hear our faintest cry. He will answer by and by. At a young age, we three boys spontaneously began singing in harmony. We started playing violin trios together. And at the age of six, I sat down at the piano and just started playing. Today, we love to travel together as a family, bringing you the love and grace of Christ. It isn't just church anymore. It's our passion. It's worshiping the Lord. It's preparing for His soon coming. Don't you see my Jesus coming? Don't you see in yonder cloud? With ten thousand angels round him, see how they my Jesus crowd. I am bound for the kingdom, will you go to glory with me? Alleluia, oh praise ye the Lord. Don't you see his arms extended? Don't you hear his charming voice? Each loving heart beats high for glory. Oh, my Jesus is my choice. I am bound for the kingdom. Will you go to glory with me? Alleluia, oh, praise ye the Lord. Don't you see the saints ascending? Hear them shouting through the air. Jesus smiling, trumpet sounding, now his glory they will share. I am bound for the kingdom, will you go to glory with me? Alleluia, oh praise ye the Lord. Alleluia, alleluia, oh praise ye. In 2013, our family went on a mission trip to Panama to help build a church, and I discovered the true joy of sacrificial giving and living for God. I've continued to be inspired as we've gone on four more mission trips and helped complete 22 churches. As I read my Bible each day, I've discovered a great truth, and that is how great a sinner I am and in need of a personal Savior. Hello, I am Levi. I'm 15 years old. I love spending time out in God's nature, and I want to be a missionary bush pilot when I grow up. Hello, my name is Lucas, and I am 16. I love to play the harmonica and violin, and my favorite verse in the Bible is Joshua 1, 9. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Hi, I'm Benjamin. I'm 12 years old. I love to play the piano and the violin, and I want to be a missionary when I grow up. I once was lost in sin, but Jesus took me in, and then a little light from heaven filled my soul. It bathed my heart in love and wrote my name above, and just a little talk with Jesus made me whole. Now let us have a little talk with Jesus, let us tell him all about our troubles. He will hear our faintest cry, and he will answer by and by. And you know a little fire is burning You will find a little talk with Jesus Makes it right Sometimes my past seems drear Without a ray of cheer And then a cloud of doubt may hide the light of day The mist is in my eyes And hide the starry skies But just a little talk with Jesus clears the way now let us have a little talk with Jesus, let us tell him all about our troubles. He will hear our faintest cry, and he will answer by and by. When you feel a little prayer will turn in, and you know a little fire is burning, you will find a little talk with Jesus makes it right. I may have doubts and fears, my eyes be filled. 
filled with tears. But Jesus is a friend who watches day and night. I go to him in prayer. He knows my every care. And just a little talk with Jesus makes it right. Now let us have, have a little talk with Jesus. Jesus. Let us tell him all about our troubles. He will hear our faintest cry. And he will answer by and by. When you feel a little prayer will turn in. And you know a little fire is burning. You will find a little talk with Jesus. Find a little talk with Jesus. Find a little Talk with Jesus makes it right. William Miller was born in 1782 in Massachusetts. He was the oldest of 16 children and raised in a farmer's family. He was the grandson of a pastor, and his mother taught him to read using the Bible. From a young age, it was noted that he was physically strong and intellectually bright. When he married, he moved to his wife's hometown and became a deist, which means he believed that God made the world and then just left it. That God did not desire a personal relationship with his creation, nor interfere in their lives. William Miller was well liked in the social circle, and for amusement he would frequently mock preachers and religious matters. He had two Baptist pastors in the family, and when they would attempt to evangelize him, he would silence them very quickly by showing them contradicting Bible verses. On September 11, 1814, William Miller stood on the banks of Lake Champlain as he fought as a captain in the war against Great Britain. There were only 5,500 American soldiers compared to 11,000 well-armed British. During battle, a mortar exploded only a few feet away from Miller. But he survived. At the end of the battle, the Americans won. That day, Miller knew beyond a doubt there was a God who had intervened and saved his life and completely changed the course of history. After the war, Miller moved to where his parents lived and to appease his mother he would attend church. But he complained about the boring deacons who would read the sermons when the pastor was away. So his mother arranged for Miller to read a sermon. As Miller read a sermon on parenting, he was deeply convicted of his sins and he saw a beautiful, loving Savior. He decided to try reading the Bible for himself from the beginning to the end. When Miller finished, he discovered there was not a single contradicting Bible verse. He also discovered the prophecy of Daniel 8.14 was about to be fulfilled. And to 2,300 days, then the sanctuary will be cleansed. Well, he reasoned, the sanctuary must be the earth, and the cleansing, then, must be Christ's second coming. When Miller discovered this truth, he wanted to just keep quiet and keep farming. But he heard a voice. Go! Tell it to the world! This voice followed him for 13 years. Miller wanted to silence the voice, so he made a deal with God. If someone asked him to preach, he would preach. Within half an hour, his nephew, who had left home on horseback the day before, arrived at his door and asked him to preach. Miller was angry at himself and God, and he ran outside in a rage. He did not want to preach, for he feared that he was wrong, but he decided to keep his promise. When Miller returned from that invitation, there was yet another invitation. And for the next 12 years, Miller gave over 4,500 lectures to over half a million people across America. Some thought Miller's conviction was crazy. There was a doctor who would tell people in town that Miller was a monomaniac. So when a family member was sick, Miller sent for that doctor. At the end of the visit, Miller asked the doctor if he would be able to diagnose a monomaniac if he saw one. The doctor said, well, of course. So Miller presented him his understanding of Daniel 8.14. When he was finished, the doctor believed. When I look at the life of William Miller, I see that there's only one way to come to know Christ, and that is through me personally searching the scriptures. We are not saved by our pastor, our spouse, or our parents, but we are saved by a personal relationship with Jesus Christ alone. Let us commit to rising every day and seeking God through the reading of his word. The Bible is God's love letter to us. He wants to walk and talk with us and guide us through life circumstances. I 
come to the garden alone while the dew is still on the roses and the voice I hear falling on my ear the Son of God disclosed Harmon was born in 1827 in Maine. Ellen desperately wanted to become a teacher, but at the age of nine, as she was walking home from school, a fellow student threw a rock and hit Ellen in the head. She was carried home, and there she lay in a coma for three weeks, expected to die. Her father, upon returning home from a trip, asked, Who is this child who has suffered such a terrible accident? The fact that her very own father didn't even recognize her cut her to the core. She attempted to return to school, but she was unable to physically and mentally endure. Ellen gave up the hope of ever obtaining an education. As Ellen lay ill around the house, she sank into a very deep and dark depression. When Ellen was 12, William Miller came to their church and preached on getting ready to meet Jesus. Ellen went forward to show her desire for salvation, but in her heart she was secretly convinced that she was unworthy to ever be a child of God. At night she silently wrestled at the thought of burning in everlasting hell, but one night she had a dream of a very kind Jesus. She then confided her fears in her mother and pastor who assured her that God will never withdraw his hand from any true seeker. She then felt complete peace when she decided to rely upon the word of God rather than her feelings. Ellen made a promise to God that day that she would do anything that he ever asked of her. 
Even though she had always been too timid to speak in public, that very evening at prayer meeting, Ellen felt impressed and shared her testimony of what God had done for her. As a young lady, Ellen married James White, a Millerite preacher who also was unable to attend school as a young child due to physical problems. But as a young adult, he became a teacher, preacher, writer, and editor through God's miraculous power. Together, they gave their lives wholeheartedly to the Lord, but this caused a great sacrifice in their personal lives. They were very poor, working a few days a week to support themselves and investing every moment possible in preaching and in writing. They were criticized by many of their friends and family, even by Ellen's own twin sister. They gave birth to four sons, but two of them died as children. Despite all of these trials, together they day by day clung to faith in Jesus Christ and obeyed God by sharing the truth of his love for mankind. Although Ellen White only obtained a third grade education, she wrote over 100,000 collegiate level manuscript pages. Her books are in the Library of Congress and she is the most translated nonfiction American author. The words Ellen wrote were most definitely not from her own mouth, but from the lips of God. As I began to read the writings of Ellen White, I discovered a Jesus Christ who wants a personal relationship with me, a God of love. Christ has done everything he can for you and I. He's created us, loved us, died on a cross for us, sent his words and prophets to teach and warn us, and right now he is interceding for us in heaven. He begs for us to die from our selfish ways and to come to him, to give him our heart. He wants to pour his love upon us, and he's just waiting for us to come to him. In my darkness, Jesus found me, touched my eyes and made me see. chains that long had bound me, gave me life and liberty. O oh, glorious love of Christ, my boy divine, that Satan stood to save a soul like mine, through all my days and then in heaven above, my song will silence never. I'll worship Him forever and praise Him for His glorious love. Oh, amazing truth to ponder, He whom angels host attend. Lord of heaven, God's Son, what wonder! The sinner's friend, O oh, glorious love of Christ, my boy divine, that Satan stooped to save a soul like mine. Through all my days and then in heaven above, my song will silence never. I'll worship him forever. And praise Him for His glorious love. And praise Him for His glorious The prophecy of Daniel 8.14 pointed to October 22, 1844. On that day, Hiram Edson and fellow Millerites gathered in his home to sing as they awaited Jesus' coming. They sang all day, but Jesus did not come. As the clock struck midnight, Hiram later wrote, Our fondest hopes and expectations were blasted, and such a spirit of weeping came over us as I have never experienced before. It seemed that the loss of all earthly friends could have been no comparison. We wept and we wept. I mused in my heart saying, my Advent experience has been the richest and brightest of all of my Christian experience. If this has proved a failure, what was the rest of my Christian experience worth? 
Is the Bible proved a failure? Is there no God, no heavens, no golden home city, no paradise? Is all of this but a cunningly devised fable? Is there no reality to our fondest hope and expectation of these things? We wept and we wept till the day dawned. As the day dawned, Hiram, as he thought over his life, realized that when brought into straight places, God had always faithfully guided him. At this thought, he and the other men went out to the barn to pray. They prayed in earnest until they sensed that God had heard their prayer and promised to explain the disappointment and make it clear. The men then, in faith, went inside to eat breakfast. As they finished breakfast, Hiram said to his fellow brethren, let's go and encourage some of our other brethren. As they stepped out that door and walked across the cornfield, all of a sudden, Hiram stopped. He realized the sanctuary was not on earth. The sanctuary was up in heaven. His mind was quickly drawn to the thoughts of the high priest who would go into the most holy place to judge the earth. Hiram had never done this before, but he quickly ran home, opened his Bible randomly, and pointed to Hebrews 8. There, Paul was discussing Christ in the most holy place. He realized his impression was grounded in the scripture. Hiram sold their wedding silver to pay for a tract to print this Bible truth. Both James White and Joseph Bates read this tract, and within a few months, Joseph Bates showed up at his door and shared with him the Sabbath truth. Hiram had to jump to his feet and said, Brother Bates, the Sabbath is biblical truth, and I am with you to keep it. In 1848, Hiram's farm was the site of an evangelistic Sabbatarian conference. This launched the Sabbatarian Adventist movement that soon became the Seventh-day Adventist Church. In 1850, Hiram sold his farm to put money towards spreading God's truth in the Review and Herald. Hiram then built up another farm and only two years later sold it again to spread more of God's truth. No matter what, Hiram did not give up hope, but he did give up his money to spread that hope. We, like Hiram, must keep our eyes fixed on Christ and must continue to persevere and spread the gospel no matter what. I have fixed my mind on another time, on another time. And here I mean to stand until God gives me more light. And that is today, today, today. Let it be.
Seventh-day Baptists did not believe it was their job to spread the biblical Sabbath truth. But at their general conference of 1841, they felt God needed them to share that. In 1842, they printed tracts to hand out. During the years 1843 to 1845, they had special days of fasting and prayer as they handed out those tracts. Rachel Oakes, a 30-year-old Seventh-day Baptist widow who lived in Washington, New Hampshire, was exceptionally diligent. In the spring of 1844, Rachel Oakes attended a communion by Millerite pastor Frederick Wheeler. He said, All persons confessing communion in such a service should be ready to follow God and keep His commandments in all things. Rachel Oakes confronted him at the end of the service and said, I came near getting up at that point in the meeting and saying something. Frederick Wheeler said, Well, what was it you had on your mind to say? She said, I wanted to tell you that you had better put that cloth back over the table until you are ready to keep all ten of God's commandments. Those words cut Wheeler deeply, and after study of scripture, he soon became the first Millerite minister to keep the Sabbath. Rachel continued to work hard to spread the Sabbath truth into the families in Washington, New Hampshire. A few accepted the Sabbath truth the fall of 1844. From here, word spread one by one. Pastor Frederick Wheeler wrote to a friend who shared the Sabbath truth with Joseph Bates. Joseph Bates then visited Hiram and Edson and James and Ellen White, and soon the Sabbath truth was spreading throughout the world. At the end of their evangelistic campaign, the Seventh-day Baptist Church reported that they were disappointed that the Christian denominations rejected the Sabbath truth. However, there was a noted exception that Millerite families tended to respond positively. Is it chance that the only years in the history of the Seventh-day Baptist Church that they have spread the Sabbath truth is 1843 to 1845? I don't think so. I think that is God's perfect timing. God loves each one of us. He wants us to spread that gospel truth with everyone around us. We may feel like complete failures. We may feel like it's not going anywhere. But we must continue to work for Him, knowing that in due season, we will reap a harvest. field now ripen there's a work for all to do hark the voice of god is calling to the harvest calling you in the mad rush of the broad the place you're called to labor seem too small and little known. It is great if God is in it and he'll not forsake his own. Are you laid aside from service body toil and care you can still be in the battle in the sacred place of prayer little is much when god is in it labor not for wealth nor fame Jesus' name. Well.
much when God is in it. Labor not for wealth nor fame. There's a crown and you can win it if you go. One of my favorite stories is of Eugene Farnsworth who lived in the town of Washington, New Hampshire. The Farnsworth family accepted William Miller's message to prepare for Christ's soon coming. They also were the first Millerite family to accept the Sabbath truth and their church was the first Sabbath-keeping Advent church and they were on fire for God. But as the church began to organize, they began to have a bad attitude towards organization and they were looking to Battle Creek for any excuse to rebel. By the 1860s, the church doors were shut and they completely backslid into the world. In hopes of a revival, James and Ellen White and Jane Andrews visited the church and the doors of the church were opened. People came to criticize their words. Ellen White was not happy with the message God gave her, but from the pulpit she began one by one pointing out the specific and secret sins of those sitting in the pews. Eugene, as he sat in the back, knew that if Ellen White was a true prophet, she would know about his father's secret chewing of tobacco. They had been working in the woods together, and he had seen his father discreetly spit and cover it up in the snow. Sure enough, Ellen White gave testimony of Mr. Farnsworth's chewing of tobacco. Mr. Farnsworth and the other adults confessed their sins and made a complete turn in their lives. The youth were then inspired and they joined in a complete revival of that little church. Eighteen youth gave their lives to the Lord and twelve youth insisted on immediate baptism despite it being December. A hole was cut one foot deep through the ice and they were baptized in Millen Pond. No wonder the majority of those youth went on to work full-time for the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Eugene was one of those youth. On another time, when Jay and Andrews visited his home, Eugene, who was extremely shy, quickly slipped out the back door to go hoe corn. Mr. Andrews saw him and quickly grabbed a hoe and followed him. Eugene quickly saw that Mr. Andrews did not know a single thing about how to hoe corn, but he just kept silent and kept hoeing. Finally, Mr. Andrews said, Eugene, what is your purpose in life? Eugene said, well, I hope to become a lawyer. Mr. Andrews said, you might do a good deal worse, and what are you going to do before that? He said, well, I hope to go to school and get an education. Yes, and what next? Well, I hope to study law. Yes, and then practice law. And what then? Well, I hope to get a job, some money, and a family. Yes, and what next? At this, Eugene began to grow nervous, for he saw exactly what it was. Well, I suppose I shall die. Again, Mr. Andrews responded, yes, and what next? My son, you take hold of something, something that will help you span that chasm, something that will land your feet on the other side where you will be safe for eternity. Those words changed Eugene's life. He spent his life as a full-time missionary for Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters, our time on earth is short. We, like Eugene, must make a decision today as to where we are going to be for eternity. Living the ways of this world while professing Christianity is pure hypocrisy. We must take hold of Christ with all our heart, all our soul, all our mind so that we can land safely on that other side. Hebrews 12 says, Therefore, since we have such a great cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us lay aside every encumbrance and that sin which so easily entangles us, and let us run with endurance that race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has now sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Let us dare to live for Jesus Christ. 
Standing by a purpose true, heeding God's command. Honor them, the faithful few, all hail to Daniel's band. Dare to be a Daniel, dare to stand alone. Dare to have a purpose firm, dare to make it known. Many mighty men are lost, daring not to stand. Who for God hath been a host by joining Daniel's band? Dare to be a Daniel, dare to stand alone. Dare to have a purpose firm, dare to make it known. Many giants, great and tall, stalking through the land. Headlong to the earth would fall if met by Daniel's band. Dare to be a Daniel, dare to stand alone. Dare to have a purpose firm, dare to make it known. Hold the gospel banner high unto victory grand. Satan and his host defy and shout for Daniel's band. Dare to be a Daniel, dare to stand alone. Dare to have a purpose firm, dare to make it known. Dare to have a purpose firm, dare Joseph Bates was born in 1792 in Massachusetts. With his home overlooking a very active shipping port, he dreamed of sailing and traveling the world. Finally, at the age of 15, against his parents' desires, he set sail on his first voyage. While at sea, he experienced many dangers. On one voyage, there was a shark swimming beside the ship waiting for lunch. Later that day, Joseph lost his balance as he climbed the masthead and he fell 60 feet into the ocean. At the last second, a rope was thrown at him, and he barely managed to grab that rope and be pulled to safety. Upon getting back on deck, he looked over and saw the shark still swimming there. Another time, Joseph was taken as a slave. D but despite all of these, he quickly advanced in position, and he was soon captain and part ship owner. While at sea, God began to transform his life. On one voyage, his wife tucked a New Testament into his trunk. He returned home a Christian. He was convicted alcohol and cursing was wrong. Later he threw his tobacco pipe into the ocean and by the end of his life he had given up tea and coffee. At the age of 36 he retired with what today would be equivalent to a million dollars. He then spent his time and money promoting temperance and opposing slavery. In 1839 Bates heard about the Advent message and then he spent his time and money promoting that message. In 1845, he read an article about the Sabbath. He then traveled from Fairhaven, Massachusetts to Washington, New Hampshire. Upon arriving in the middle of the night by foot at the house of Frederick Wheeler, he then was so excited to study the Bible that he spent the rest of the night studying about Sabbath. Upon returning home, he passed his friend on the bridge. His friend said, what news have you, Captain Bates? Bates responded, the news is that the seventh day is the Sabbath. His friend responded, I'll read my Bible and see about that. The following Sabbath, they spent it together. He then spent his time promoting the Sabbath. A few years later, as he was writing a tract on Sabbath, his wife came to him and said, I need some flour. How much flour do you lack? He asked. Oh, just four pounds. So Bates went to the store and he returned with four pounds of flour. His wife said, have you, Captain Bates, a man who has set sail with vessels out of New Bedford to all parts of this world, gone out into town and returned with only four pounds of flour? Bates said, wife, I have spent for that flour the last money I have on earth. His wife burst into tears and said, what are we going to do? 
Captain Bates, with all the dignity of a captain, stood to his feet and said, I am going to write a book. I am going to circulate it and spread this message before the entire world. His wife said, well, great. And what are we going to live on? The Lord will provide a way. A while later, as Bates was writing, he felt impressed to go to the post office. He went to the post office and found a letter there, but postage was due. The postmaster told him, just take the letter and pay me later. But Bates refused. So the postmaster opened the letter and out fell $10. Bates gave orders for barrels of food to be delivered to his wife. And he strode back across that bridge and made arrangements for 1,000 of his Sabbath tracts to be printed. How is our faith? Do we love Jesus enough to give everything that we have to spread that good news of him to others? Galatians 6, 7 through 9 says, Do not be deceived. God will not be mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth that, he will reap. For whoever sows from the flesh will from the flesh reap destruction. But he who sows to please the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. Therefore, let us not grow weary in doing good. For in due season we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. I saw one weary, sad and torn, with eager steps press on the way, who long the hallowed cross had borne, still looking for the promised day. While many a line of grief and care upon his brow was furrowed there, I asked what buoyed his spirits up. Oh, this said he the blessed hope. And one I saw with sword and shield, who boldly braved the world's cold frown, and fought unyielding on the field to win an everlasting crown. The one with toil oppressed by foes, no murmur from his heart arose. I asked what buoyed his spirits up. Oh, this said he, the blessed hope. And there was one who left behind the cherished friends of early years, and honor, pleasure, wealth resigned to tread the path bedewed with tears. Through trials deep and conflicts sore, yet still a smile of joy he wore. I asked what buoyed his spirits up. Oh, this said he, the blessed hope. While pilgrims here we journey on in this dark veil of sin and gloom through In 1844, the Millerites, in faith that Christ was coming, did not harvest their potatoes. So did they starve then because of their misunderstanding? The potatoes harvested on time that year in America were destroyed by the potato blight. But the Millerites still had potatoes in the ground they were able to dig up, eat through the winter, and sell for a high price. What about the misunderstanding of October 22, 1844? Was William Miller crazy? Absolutely not. There were other individuals in other countries studying their Bibles, realizing that the 2300-day prophecy would end in 1844, and they felt the need to prepare for Christ's soon coming. Were the Millerites foolish to think that Christ's coming was so soon? Absolutely not. Eve expected her son Cain to be the Messiah, and when he murdered his brother, she then expected Seth to be the Messiah. Soon God's people gave up on an ever-returning Messiah. 
but a few individuals who were individually reading their Bibles knew when to expect the Messiah, and they were richly blessed to see and recognize him. Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his disciples expected Christ to deliver them from Rome, but they were wrong. They lived through that great disappointment Friday evening when Christ died on the cross. But when they realized that in their great disappointment, prophecy had been fulfilled, that Christ had died for their sins, their disappointment was turned into such a great joy that they then spread the gospel to the entire known world in only one short generation. Christ's children expected his return October 22, 1844. They were mistaken as to what the cleansing of the sanctuary was. But soon after, just like the disciples, they realized that prophecy had been fulfilled. On October 22, 1844, Christ entered the most holy place so that he can judge the world and come again. Brothers and sisters, the judgment is great news. We rejoice at the news of his judging the earth so that he can come again. As each child repents, he may have his record clear and name written in the book of life. will descend from heaven with a shout and with the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise first then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air and thus we shall always be with our Lord I look around me I see prophecies fulfilled and so times there are people
The Lord Jesus is coming soon in the clouds, and I want to be ready for that day. But this is a real spiritual battle. The devil is working hard to get us discouraged, whether it's by giving us the pleasures of this world so that we walk away or sending us trials so that we give up on our personal relationship with Jesus Christ. But let us fix our eyes on Jesus Christ. Let us open up the word and study and remember that day that is soon to come so that we will be ready to meet him when we see him with our very own eyes. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. Though no one join me, still I will follow. Though no Join me, still I will follow. Though no one join me, still I will follow. No turning back, no turning back, no turning back. The world behind me, the cross before me. The world behind me, the cross before me. The world behind me, the cross before me. No turning back, no turning back, no turning back. No turning back. Showers of blessing. This is the promise of love. There shall be seasons refreshing sent from the Savior above. Showers of blessing. Showers of blessing we need. Mercy drops round us are falling, but for the showers we plead. There shall be showers of blessing, precious reviving again. Over the hills and the valleys, send of abundance of rain. Showers of blessing, showers of blessing we need. Mercy drops round us are falling, but 
for the showers we plead. There shall be showers of blessing. Send them upon us, O Lord. Grant to us now a refreshing. Come and now honor thy word. Showers of blessing. Showers of blessing we need. Mercy drops round us are falling. But for the showers we Midnight. At the midnight.